Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, a conversation with Jeff Edgers, Washington Post national arts reporter and author of Walk This Way, Run DMC, Aerosmith, and the song that changed American music forever. Plus new music from next week's guest, Nat Freeberg. I'm your host, Nick Zeno. If you are a fan of music or comedy, you should already know Jeff Edgers. He was a longtime arts writer with the Boston Globe before moving to the Washington Post, where he has written some extraordinary pieces on Roseanne Barr, Chevy Chase, Norm MacDonald, and the article his new book, Walk This Way, is based on. He makes it clear he is a reporter, not an analyst. So what you get from his writing is facts about the most fascinating subjects. You hear from both Chase and his detractors. You see text exchanges between him and MacDonald. You see Roseanne speaking publicly in Israel. He doesn't have to dress up a story because he knows how to show you the most interesting and relevant parts. There are some who say the subtitle to to Edger's book, Run DMC, Aerosmith, and The Song That Changed American Music Forever, is hyperbole. I can attest that it is not. I was in seventh grade when the Run DMC, Aerosmith version of Walk This Way came out, and I could see the impact firsthand, starting with myself. We discussed this in the conversation, but I can tell you, I was a kid who didn't think of rap as music because it didn't have guitars or real instruments. That made me a prime target for producer Rick Rubin, and it worked. Not just on me, but others I knew as a kid who reacted to that song the way I did. It opened my world up a bit, and if it didn't happen knowingly for everyone, it did make them shake their ass, which is a damn fine start. The conversation picks up with Edgers in his home office talking about a Clash podcast narrated by Chuck D and how the timeline for how music changed from the 60s to the 80s moves so briskly. Stick around afterwards for Something Good About Love from Nat Friedberg's latest album, Better Late Than Never. And now, Jeff Edgers. Well, lots of people don't know who the Clash are. Mm -hmm. It's a sad thing, you know? I think. I mean, that's ultimately, I mean, this whole like walk this way thing. It's like, there are people who don't know who Aerosmith is. There are people who don't know who Run DMC are, you know? It's completely insignificant to them. Yeah, you have to, you, you can never assume knowledge. Uh, you, know, you never know who doesn't know who the, the Beatles are or they have some concept of they were this, they were a million years ago. And that was, was one of the things that, that, that hit me in this book when you, when you, you make a reference to the Beatles that, that, you know, they did a certain thing just as the Beatles had 20 years before. Yeah. And I can't remember what the specific was, but it, it hit me that that's not a long time to to go from the Beatles to run DMC singing Walk This Way. No, I mean, I, I watched it the other night. I was watching Woodstock, that movie, and Sha Na Na came on there. And I was like, well, that's really weird. Like, what are they doing? And then you start thinking about it and they're in there with their like sort of hippie slash greaser look. And it's 1969. But in fact, that was only 13 years earlier. I mean, in mm-hmm. our time, we're talking about 2006. That's yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, what's ha- You know what I mean? It's like uh, maybe that was like when the third Foo Fighters record came out. Like, <laughs> right. It's just time, you know when you invent something like that, I mean, the fact is the Beatles had invented something. Mm -hmm. So that seemed revolutionary. And the same thing with run DMC, they invented something, but, uh, the gaps of time are like much shorter than you actually think they are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Beatles are gone in, in 70 officially. And when, when, when does run DMC start? What year? Well, they start out like in, you know, early eighties, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, that first record comes out in 84. Mm-hmm. You know, I think Sucker MC, I think, is um, 83, though, the single. Mm-hmm. So it's not that big of a gap. Yeah. Oh, and you, <laughs> when you use Aerosmith to to bridge that gap, you know, Beatles are gone in 70. Walk This Way comes out. At, was it 76 or 78? It was not 78. I mean, Walk This Way is funny because it's on Toys in the Attic, which is 75. Mm-hmm. But I think they released the single Aerosmith did twice. Right. Because it really didn't do that well the first time. And so it might be 76 that it comes out the second time and actually mm-hmm. becomes a hit. I think Sweet Emotion was far more successful mm-hmm. off that record. So, yeah. It, I mean, look, Aerosmith was playing gigs in 1970, right? So, yeah. Well, they met in 69, right? Or 68. Right. Yeah, at, yeah. At, uh, somewhere out so in New Hampshire. it's all connected. You know, somebody the other day 
I went to that Mop the Hoople concert, and you know Ian Hunter is seventy nine, and it got somebody in New York to go to the concert, and they brought their eight year old kids. I said, hey, dude, when they're seventy nine, we're going to be covering a stretch of about a hundred and eighty years since Ian Hunter's birth. I mean, that's so weird. <laughs> right. That's why I want to like, even though I know it's thousands of dollars, I want to take my boy to see the Rolling Stones because. Mm. There's something crazy in my brain about him someday being an old man and saying he saw the Rolling Stones. I feel like it would be the equivalent of me just turning up and going, Cal, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, well, I mean, I saw B.B. King, but I mean, it'd be even more. Yeah. It'd be like, Cal, I, I remember Buddy Bolden. I uh -huh. mean, that, wow, he was good in 1920. You know, like, it just feels like sometime that's going to be such ancient history. We've just never seen our heroes play this long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then people, there are people who worship Kurt Cobain now who weren't alive when Nirvana was around. Right, Kurt C Cobain today, he'd be, he'd have like rheumatoid arthritis or, uh, right, or he'd be doing Pilates. I mean, I'm not sure about that, but uh, <laughs> he'd be an old man like I am. God. And would he still be cool? Right, would he? I mean, I don't know. It's like, is Eddie Vedder cool? I didn't think Eddie Vedder was cool then, and he's probably cooler now, but maybe he isn't. I, who knows, uh, right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis is still kicking around playing. Uh, Linda Gale Lewis, I just I just saw play with Robbie Fulks, and she was laying down a great piano. Or the Meat and, Puppets. I mean, they have a new record out, which is quite excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like, we could go on and on about yeah. old people who are still good. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, I just saw Mott the Hoople, you know? I mean, I would have paid... They said the tickets were going for that thing on StubHub for six bucks right up to the show. I would have paid six bucks to see him just play all the young dudes. That was an awesome thing to see. Well, well, getting back to 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 the book, how long have you wanted to write this story? This seems like a a dream book for uh, for a writer. It's it's so relevant. It, it, there are so many different wonderful characters, and it seems like when you started writing, you had to think, why, why has nobody already written this book? Well, for me, it's a dream because I'm, you know, I was 13 years old when Aerosmith, you know, Joe Perry got back together with Steven Tyler and they went on the back in the saddle tour and they played the Worcester Centrum. And I remember that I was a super rabid Aerosmith fan. Mm -hmm. And then I was 15 when uh, Walk This Way, the Run DMC version came out in 1986, which I'm, you know, in Brookline, so a suburb of Boston. And I've got it played on BCN, which is our our hometown, you know, station that they're the ones who revolutionized everything by choosing to play it and break the format. And it seems like you, you must've started writing and go, well, why has nobody already written this book? Why has nobody already told this story? Well, I think the, I mean, I wasn't surprised nobody's told this story. I mean, if you're writing a book on Bruce Springsteen or Brian Wilson or, you know, whatever, they're going to be like 5,000, you know, I'm the guy who made a, documentary about the kinks because there was no documentary i mean how mm -hmm. many documentaries and stories and books are there on the beatles you know mm -hmm. which doesn't mean you can't write an amazing one i mean that rob sheffield book that came out was amazing but i knew that there wasn't a definitive history now aerosmith has their own book called walk this way mm -hmm. uh, which was their sort oral history that they did but i also knew that there was a period of aerosmith that i'm particularly fascinated in which is from 1979 to 1986, mm -hmm. which is a period where they basically were like a completely broken down band of, of, of drug addicts. And Joe Perry had left the band and they made this record done with mirrors, which I loved when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to explore that, that era of Aerosmith. But ultimately, look, my job, I mean, you know, it's like, it's a dream to do any of these stories. I mean, we're paid to explore the things that we're interested in. It's, 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 it's amazing. And I was a fan of Aerosmith when I was, you know, a kid and I was a fan of run DMC when I was a kid. So to be able to call those guys and ask them any question, to be able to have Steven Tyler call me up when I'm buying fabric with my daughter and yelling uh -huh. at me for something. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I'm thrilled to be able to do that. It's like a gift. Mm -hmm. And this functions as a, uh, a profile of three different artists. Uh, that's, that's my impression of it. Run DMC and Aerosmith. You kind of start at the beginning of both of them. You start at the, the, the beginning of, of Rick Rubin. 
and you also, to to some extent, managed to tell the the story of hip hop itself and how it went from party music to streetwise and socially conscious, and black artists on MTV and SNL. There's so much ground that you cover. Yeah, it's and, funny because there, uh, it, the book has gotten largely positive reviews. If I've gotten any kind of blowback. It's like that there isn't enough analysis of like race relations and what it means for like a white band to, to get work with a black band and to have that lead to popularity. But I felt like the, my job here was not to be one of those super smart people that have all <laughs> sorts of things to analyze and write essays about. My job was that I talked to everybody in Aerosmith multiple times. I talked to Run and Daryl. I talked to Rick Rubin. I talked to more than 80 other people who were involved intricately in everything. And I felt like my job was to use that material and share as much as I could. And just getting that out in one book felt like, you know, overwhelming almost. You want to mm -hmm. do that right. And so like Aerosmith and Run DMC ultimately they meet in March of 1986 in a studio, but they really don't have anything. in it's not like they're growing up together or they have some connect. There's actually no connection, which mm -hmm. makes it so interesting. So to tell that story, you basically have to tell the first half of the book with completely different stories. Mm -hmm. So you're telling the dual story of Aerosmith's rise and fall and run DMC slash hip hop's rise, you know, and you're, you know, I alternate chapters. I didn't want to mesh them too closely together. Mm -hmm. And then later I'm able to actually, you know, bring them, bring them together because I'll, you know, it's not just Aerosmith, Run DMC, Rick Rubin. It's also Larry Smith, the producer of Run DMC's first couple records that I feel like has been forgotten. Mm -hmm. It's also MC Chirac, who, with the Funky Four Plus One, was on Saturday Night Live in like 1981 mm -hmm. and also created this sort of amazing echo effect that would influence so many people. It's Grandmaster Kaz, who had his rhymes stolen for Rapper's Delight and, you know, is doing hip hop bus tours in New York City. You pay 70 bucks and Grandmaster Kaz will be at the front rapping and showing you everything. It's amazing mm -hmm. to me. So it's it's about all that stuff. And as you can tell, I'm very enthusiastic about it. And uh, uh, for me, the job is to get all that data and information in a really uh, clear way to people reading. Right. And, and it's not a 500 page book. You got all of that in, in a, in a very concise and, and fast read, I, I think, as well. I guess I could have made it 500 pages. Maybe I should have. I don't know, like Peter Guralnik's books are so amazing. Those uh, are like 500, aren't they? Yeah, well, yeah, some of them. They're, they're these giant tomes. And I, I think that that makes, so, I think that probably keeps some people from reading it. There's also like, I remember reading Harlot's Ghost, that, that Norman Mailer novel. Mm -hmm. I was in like Spain and I was kind of sick. And it was like more than 1,200 pages long. And I remember doing like push-ups between each chapter. It was almost like punishment. So I, I did want to keep it tight. I felt like that was just the way to go with it. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's ultimately it's about everything, but it's about one song. So it's like how do you how do you tell that right? I mean, I do think I do believe in the power of economy, mm -hmm. you know? Well yeah, and it's still of this sort of epic story. You've still told so much history of of of, of the, the, the two different bands involved, of all the producers involved. And, yeah. Yeah. So, and you also you said uh, in your acknowledgments that you thank your interview subjects for a kind of immersion and answering uncommon questions, and that with the the interview you did with the Dan Patrick Show, where you said I like reporting, that seems to be something that that's sort of lost. The people who criticized the, who criticized the book for not having enough analysis were probably expecting more analysis than reporting. Well, I don't. You know, it's very hard to, um, I mean, I have to say that, uh, you know, I've been told by people not to read reviews, you know, but mm -hmm. I mean, like I got out of the box, like James Parker gave this amazing review in the Atlantic and Rob Sheffield gave this amazing review in the globe and Alison Stewart in the Washington post, the New York times person who I didn't know was like a, uh, was a, she's a, a very smart person, a, an, a, a prison, prison advocate like anti-prison advocate. I don't know mm -hmm. even how to describe it, but she kind of 
sometimes people bring their own thing into a review. Like, mm-hmm. this is the point I want to make. Mm-hmm. And there was a little bit of that. And uh, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, the thing that I long for as a reader, if I'm reading like a really nitty gritty book about something that I love is... I want to learn things that I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. So while I feel like I might know everything about Aerosmith to actually hear from their producer that he didn't think they were good enough at guitar, Joe Perry and Brad Whitford, that he brought in other guitars and he required those guitars to give them guitar lessons. (laughs) Oh my God, I've never heard that before. You know, for me sitting with Ted Templeman, which I did the guy who found Van Halen and produced all those records and then did the Done With Mirrors record, sitting next to him on the couch and being able to ask him any question I want to in the world and having him answer it, or even like bringing this, you know, unreleased footage of the recording day to Reverend Run in his mansion in in New Jersey and showing it to him and having him narrate it as he watches it, which he's never seen it. I mean, why would I waste time trying to be smart? I'm not that smart. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I I just keep my recorder going and get the material down. I just, there's so many, like Malcolm Gladwell can expound on the meaning of, you know, every little synapse. I I just, that's not who I am. That's not who I've ever considered myself to be. I consider myself to be a reporter. I mean, David Halberstam got criticized. I'm not comparing myself to him, but, Mm -hmm. you know, he got criticized for not, like for like being a reporter almost like uh-huh. not being like a like gifted enough as a thinker or writer but being like a reporter i'm cool with that i don't mind you know like there's so many people who are so much smarter than i am critics and analysts let them do that thing mm-hmm. uh that said i believe the way to advocate for a point of view is through reporting so to me when you spend as much time on Larry Smith and make the argument that he is a key figure that has been wiped out of society, or mm-hmm. when you make the key argument to me that Aerosmith didn't save Run DMC, that Run DMC saved Aerosmith, I want to back that up with my reporting, and I feel like that is how I make my point. You know, right. that's how that's my point of view. And there are a lot of murky issues surrounding a, a lot of the players in this book, and you don't decide for the reader what the story is you present there are there are different points in the story like who came up with the beat for walk this way right which is which is a weird thing that you would i I never would have thought of i hadn't i don't know if that's ever come up in another story who came up with that that beat whether it was steven tyler who sat behind the drums at sound check in some gig in hawaii or or whether it was uh, uh kramer came up with it in the studio you present both sides, and they don't even seem to remember now. Well, I've re- I, you know, Rich Cohen, who I really like as a writer, he wrote a book on the Rolling Stones. And what I liked about it is, you know, time passes, things get murky. And what he did is, when there were moments that he wanted to present that were in dispute, he just presented all the different points of view on the, those moments. Mm-hmm. I, I really was thinking about that when it came to the beat thing. Because, look, these guys, I mean, it says so much to me that, first of all, the beat's really important. Mm -hmm. But also these guys, after 45 years, can't agree on who created the Walk This Way beat. That's really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, how how can how can they still be arguing about it? So I just felt like let's play that one out and let's present all sides and let the reader decide, you know, and it could be a little bit of everything. And there's a a weird parallel there uh, because Simmons resented Larry Smith for the beat on Sucker MCs. Was that it that that? uh... That, uh, I think Simmons he, felt like he didn't get credit for that beat or something. Yeah, which is funny because I mean, he got a lot of credit, and Larry Smith did not get a lot of credit. Mm-hmm. I think when they took, because they had that they had a song called "Action," that uh, Larry Smith recorded um, before Run DMC, and "Action" had a real live drummer, Trevor Gale, because they didn't have drum machines at that point, creating mm-hmm. that beat. And that was a beat that was taken later on for Sucker MCs. And I think Russell Simmons was complaining because he got writing credit on action, but he didn't get it on Sucker MCs. Mm-hmm. Something like that. I don't know. But that was such a, a strange parallel where you wouldn't necessarily think the issues and dynamics would be the same in Aerosmith as they would be in Run DMC or, or creating uh, creating hip-hop necessarily just because the, the mechanics of it well, credit, are so though. different. I mean, the thing... I think the common thing is 
everybody in the music world, no matter which genre you're in, no matter what you're playing, the, the thing that people always fight over is credit. Mm -hmm. Who deserves the credit? Who influenced this? Who, who made this happen? Who is the leader? And I think that resonates through every music story. Mm -hmm. And then, then there's an, another parallel but with uh, uh, Jam Master J not giving, getting enough credit and then the, the insignificant three uh, concept in Aerosmith the, that less we, important three the less important three yeah, right? Like, right oh sorry that that's <laughs> that sounds like an inference on my part but, uh, yeah John Kalander who just I mean I gotta say I'm pleased he sent me a note yesterday saying he liked that he was so pleased with the with the book John Kalander who's the executive at Geffen who signed them you know uh, signed Aerosmith for their quote-unquote comeback he would call the other guys the LI three less important three. Right. Um, Joey Kramer, the drummer, Tom Hamilton, the bassist, and Brad Whitford, the guitarist, which really hurt their feelings. And then that sort of is, um, you know, backed up when they go to make this walk this way. They bring Tyler and Perry to the studio and don't have the other guys involved. And when they make that video, they actually hire a fake band, not a fake band. I'm sorry, a real band smashing gladys that's from new york mm -hmm. to stand behind tyler and perry and pretend basically they're aerosmith so they're not like in the picture too much but they're in the picture enough that it looks like aerosmith is playing mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah but, and then there, there's the bits about uh, uh tyler and perry sort of worrying about the what the other guys might have thought make try to make the guys in the video not look quite as much like uh like the guys in Aerosmith, so it's clear we're not trying to make them look like right, like they're worried they're, about it, but not worried about enough to actually bring them there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and at one point, we we you talked about this a, a, a couple minutes ago. You explored the idea that Walk This Way didn't really help Run DMC that they already had hits in the hip hop world that it and it might even have come across as a betrayal. In some ways, to to the uh, to hip hop fans, did that story, did that aspect of the story surprise you when you got into that? Well, walk this way, yes, it did. I mean, one thing that surprised me is Lior Cohen, you know, who became like this, you know, the famous record executive. He really complains about walk this way, but you know, my knowledge of Lior Cohen is watching him in the in the unreleased footage from 1986 as some like little frizzy haired kid mm -hmm. who's like an assistant for a run dmc bopping along as joe perry records his thing he looks as into it as anybody else which he might have been back then um but walk this way was a complicated thing for run dmc because it's a good song there's no question it's mm -hmm. it, it and it's in sequence on raising hell it works better for me than as a single actually i just like the way it slides into the beat uh, but it's not their best song and it's not their best song on raising hell mm -hmm. so how do you broker your situation where you're writing all this stuff, you're doing your original music, and then you do this song that's a cover, which was not done in rap ever. Mm -hmm. um, and you bring in these two white guys, and that's also never done. And that happens to not just be successful, it's like out of this world successful, and suddenly it's what you're known for best. I mean, Run DMC had sold, you know, their previous record, King of Rock, had gone... Uh, platinum and while they weren't as popular as like billy ocean or starship they were <laughs> the first right. rap super group so then the question becomes is it a good thing to get that much like to, to to make a decision that might distract people from your best work to become that popular you know mm -hmm. i'd say what's the big deal but I can understand how they might feel differently because they're like, hey, my Adidas is like 10 times better than this. Why aren't we getting the attention for that? Mm -hmm. yeah, and then they weren't playing Walk This Way live. They started that tour in 86. They did not actually have Walk This Way in their uh, set list. Like, it's kind of amazing, but it's true. And they just had to because it became so big. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was in junior high when this came out you said you were uh you were in high, high school i would have been 15 so i guess i would have been a sophomore in high school what did 15 year old you think of this song when you heard it or entering my sophomore year in high school you know i don't remember the moment of walk this way but what i do remember is i remember the moment of run dmc 
because mm-hmm. like every other kid, I remember when MTV and then Friday Night Videos. I mean, most of the stuff that I got really into at that time, I would just when you would watch the Clash doing, you know, Rock the Casbah, that video where mm-hmm. like Joe Strummer's got a mohawk and like Mick Jones is wearing that weird thing over his head. That was so cool to me. Or, if, you know, eagerly waiting to see when the police like they had some weird videos that you wouldn't really see that much. And mm-hmm. like, wow, the talking heads or like the police. So I remember watching Run DMC's videos, you know, King of Rock, where they went to the a fake Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh-huh. And Larry Bud Melman was like the guard and wouldn't let him in. I remember okay. that vividly. I remember Rockbox, the first video that they made where Eddie Martinez's guitar was all over that. And I just thought, wow, this is like crazy interesting. But what I think, looking back at it, is probably Walk This Way was a huge hit. And when it was a huge hit and MTV started playing Walk This Way, they threw those other videos into heavier rotation. Mm. My guess is that. In 1984, Rockbox was not being played in heavy rotation, and I probably wasn't seeing it on MTV. I mean, 1984 would have been too young for me to know Run DMC all that well. I was not a hip-hop obsessive Mm -hmm. back then. I I mean, Run DMC opened the door for me, and it brought me to, you know, basically groups like Tribe Called Quest or Public Enemy or De La Soul. But at that point, I needed it to be handed to me by my format. And, and by the way, that that rock box video, I was delighted to find Professor Irwin Corey. In yeah, that. I mean, I'd never guys... seen it when I was because I, I, I didn't have MTV. I just had Friday night videos. We didn't have cable or when Friday I night videos. Never. I mean, they just wouldn't have put that on. There was only like it was like an hour and a half long, right? Yeah. So they had to put like you know wrapped around your finger and like dancing on the ceiling. They did not Madonna. They did not have room for Run DMC. Thing is, Profile Records. And Steve Plotnicki, who people kind of see as a villain, but I see as a more complicated figure. Um, You know, Steve Plotnicki was always conscious. He's one of the owners of Profile. Always conscious of the need to try to reach outside of the hip-hop audience, which was quite small and Mm -hmm. quite, you know, basically like a sub, sub, uh, what do you call it? Subculture. Mm -hmm. Um, And... So he putting Professor Irwin Corey and also in that video for Rockbox, there's a little white kid who kind of like has kind of weird connection with like Jam Master J. Mm-hmm. King of Rock has Larry Bud Melman, who's famous for the Letterman show. You know, it it was always there was always a conscious sense that like if we're going to break these guys into a different world, we need to do whatever we can, even if it's like very blunt and like right in your face and obvious which is the Walk This Way video, Mm -hmm. you know, breaking down the physical wall between rock and rap. And there's a wall, and they break (laughs) it. I mean, what could be more, like, obvious? But um, they were always conscious about the need to do that. Well, when I saw this in in, in probably seventh grade, maybe eighth grade, it it occurs to me reading this and and, uh, reading Rick Rubin's ideas for this, I was a kid who was just starting to, they were just starting to teach us civil rights. I was reading about Tom Metzger and the skinheads in Rolling Stone, the resurgence that, that was happening then. And I was also the, the, the rock and roll kid, the no synthesizers, the, like the, the rock snob. Because I, I grew up in Rochester, New York, which is a very uh, classic rock town or was when I, when I was growing up. So reading this book, it occurs to me, I was at least part of the target audience for this because I, I didn't think uh, rap and hip hop was music at that point. I, 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 it just seemed like crap to me, but I definitely had a cassette of Raisin Hell when that came out and, and I definitely responded to that video, the, the, like the pro wrestling uh, size kind of uh, a theme of that of that wall breaking down and i definitely did think about the music differently after walk this way right yeah totally completely i mean the fact is it's really hard to introduce a new thing to i mean it's so rare that it happens nowadays it really doesn't mm-hmm. actually but i think you know hip-hop if you think about it it's got to be i mean call it saying grunge was something Okay, I get it, but there are precedents. There's like, mm-hmm. there's a, a stylistic connection to music from the past. 
But for hip hop to suddenly arrive the way it did with Run DMC or the Fat Boy or whatever, um, you know, it was really probably the last major innovation in popular culture, music wise. Mm -hmm. I think you know. I mean, it, it, it it's as weird as like rock and roll suddenly appearing. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, I think about that sometimes. What could the next innovation be really? When we've we've had. We've had samples. We've had combining different uh, different genres. I'm, what would a new genre sound like if, if not just you know atonal you know sonic weirdness with with no beat with no you know where, where what's the next thing we could do? I don't. Well, I, maybe that's why I, I'm not the one who's who's innovating. But. It's hard to know. It's you know it feels like you can't. I mean. I, I throw my hands up and just say, you can't have anything new, right? But then we get like, you know, this crazy song that's got Billy Ray Cyrus on it now, you know? What, which song is Little that? Little Nas X, you know, you've got that rap oh, song yeah. that has, that gets kicked off the, you know, I, I mean, I'm not saying that's as innovative and in many ways it's like sort of a little bit of a copycat, but it's interesting and, and it's catchy. Um, but yeah, it's hard, it, 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 it's hard to, it's like literature, you know, you read um, like the ginger man and then the Rachel papers. And then they, you go, well, I don't think you can have another one of those novels about like a sort of mischievous, badass kid mm -hmm. man who like doesn't really date right and sometimes steals things. But then one comes out and you go, wow, that's pretty good. So, I, you know, I don't know if there's a way to have a wholesale, wholesale stylistic revolution anymore in music, mm -hmm. but then maybe someone will come up with it. And that, now we've got this genre identity crisis. That that one song, I think the the one you mentioned was the uh, the they they were uh, wondering whether that should be added to country music playlists, or whether that was country music. When there are hip hop artists in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now, and there were, you know, what was it? Was it Gene Simmons? That was complaining that, that hip hop artists shouldn't be in the rock and roll. Well, complain all you want, but you know that that's the thing about you know I get sometimes someone will say um you know the title of the book they'll say uh you know they'll they'll go is this hyperbole you know Run DMC Eras but then the song that changed American music forever but what they don't realize or think about to me is you know in 1986 there had never been a mashup. Uh, in 1986, there had not been a rap cover song. I mean, I don't want to call Curtis Blow's Taking Care of Business a cover. Mm -hmm. I guess technically it is. I don't know. Um, in 1986, there was no uh, In Living Color. There was no Yo MTV Raps. There was no Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. There were, you know, rap was not part of both our mainstream culture and our television and our marketing and products. It just wasn't. It was mm. a small little thing. So, you know, I wouldn't have chosen that title if I didn't believe ultimately in the fact that it changed. It did change it. You mm. know, not all for good. I mean, look, there was a lot of terrible. You know, I remember that Fat Boys, Beach Boys thing, right. Wipeout, and then the one with Chubby Checker they did. Mm. Those were terrible, and the Fat Boys were good. You know, mm. it almost like ruined them, you well, know, they... chasing after the, 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 you know, the imitation. Well, there's the Mary Mary thing that the, that Run DMC did, which is not terrible there. though. Yeah, I've, I've, I was thinking if you're gonna call Walk This Way the betrayal of hip hop, like no, nah, you 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 got one album early. Mary Mary seems more like the song you you're thinking of in terms of of it didn't seem like a natural combination. You know, that's the last. It. It's funny because that's the thing that Rick Rick Rubin produced that song. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it was on top of the leather in the next record, but he didn't produce that record. That was the last thing he did with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you also have the Beastie Boys. I mean, they come up with, um, you know, uh, it, really interesting samples, which had, you know, I mean, sampling hadn't really even been done. I mean, that's the thing that's amazing is I wonder what, if Walk This Way doesn't exist, is Tribe Called Quest and Public Enemy and De La Soul, that whole next wave, even NWA, maybe, did they get as much attention as they would have or as right. i did get you know what i mean right. i mean de la soul that record was like the record of 89 i remember well and another thing that strikes me about this story is is how fragile the success 
of, of walk this way was how many things had to happen for that to happen it, it could have just as easily been acdc in that room uh, as aerosmith so could have been yeah re- except they wouldn't have done it right they <laughs> except they wouldn't have done it right they weren't so desperate or open there are so many places along the way where if somebody did you know they, they might not even shown up that day no because there was a car rental uh fiasco that that uh that that uh, that you you write about in there as well that that the, a car had gone missing and was it was it DMC Daryl didn't Daryl and Run were freaked out because I guess they had, I guess Daryl's the only one who had his the credit card and Run and had rented a rented a Lincoln and uh, he either forgot where he parked it or it had been stolen I'm not sure and they were freaked out because they thought budget was just going to charge him the whole car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that might have that might have derailed this. I mean, anything could have derailed this. Anything, because it was only one day, right? You know? So anything could have, or they might, you know, it could have been derailed by them deciding, hey, let's not put this out, because raising hell was basically done. Mm-hmm. So it could have been anything. You're right. I mean, the fact that that, and then it getting to BCN and having Oedipus, the program director, embrace it because Aerosmith were like the hometown guys. Mm-hmm. If that gets to the radio program where he's like, you know what, we don't play rap, then MTV mm-hmm. doesn't pick. You know, all these things don't happen. So yeah, you're right. I mean, it took everything. And permanent vacation doesn't happen probably if this doesn't happen. Well, again, it's like Aerosmith really. I mean, they physically cleaned up because of Walk This Way, mm-hmm. um, but they also philosophically, you can make a pretty good argument that they finally were like, you know what, maybe we'll listen to other people as opposed mm-hmm. to holding ourselves off in this rehearsal space not telling anyone what's going on not really putting you know struggling sometimes to write after that they're like hey you know we can work with people we can get Mm -hmm. co-writers we can go to vancouver to record our rec you know we can do things differently and it changed everything for them really And, and even at the point when when they're all in the room together and recording nobody was incredibly thrilled about the idea so it could have gone wrong even the day it's happening. Yeah, I mean, you watch that video, and I have it up on my, I mean, I have copies of the video that I've sent out to people, and I can show it to, if anybody hears this and writes me, I'll I'll send them a link to it. But um, you can see it in the video. You can see them in the studio that day, and they're pretending to be friends or pretending mm. to admire each other, but it's not really a good, the acting isn't very good. You mm-hmm. can see that they have no idea who the other side is, nor do they care, you know? There's not, like, some incredible respect, like, Oh my God, that's Aerosmith. They're big rock stars. Or, ooh, that's Run DMC. They're the hottest new thing. None of that. You know, it's not like what we're accustomed to seeing, where people collaborate and come together, and there's this incredible love fest. And there's there are some great supporting characters in here as well. That uh, Rick Dufay uh, seems like somebody who you could devote a, a whole podcast to. He seems like. A guy who would have a lot of interesting stories, and then you talk about Mark Bell singing for the the Joe Perry Project, and that that's another sort of illustration of how fragile the, this whole enterprise is of making an impact somewhere, because for him, being in that that was a career high point, and you make the point that it was probably his time in that band was probably a career low point for for Joe Perry. Yeah, I mean Mark Bell was so great because Cowboy Mock is what they call him, but. You know, Joe Perry had this solo band after he left Aerosmith called the Joe Perry Project, and they made three records, and they started out pretty strong. They had, like, you know, Jack Douglas produced their first record. It sold okay. It had some good songs on it, let the music do the talking. But by the third record, they were just scraping the bottom of the barrel, and they had, you know, barely got a record deal, and they were just cruising around, like, the East Coast in this borrowed van, this van mm-hmm. that had that belonged to Jonathan Edwards. And um, it was really grim. I mean, like, Joe was really in bad shape with drugs and drinking. Mm. Um, You know, I called him about it. I mean, there's one incident that Mark Bell describes where Joe has, like, a seizure, basically, in the van. Mm -hmm. And somebody leans forward and jams a wallet into his mouth to keep him from choking. And, of course, I asked Joe about that. And he's like, yeah, I hadn't had enough. I I hadn't had enough to eat. My doctor just said I needed some steak. Mm -hmm. I mean, (laughs) that's not really what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he was in really the lowest point of his career. I mean, whatever the opposite of playing for 78,000 people at the Texas Jam, you know, in 1978, 
that's where he was. And, you know, Mark Bell, it was the most exciting and the best situation he'd ever be in. And so he had, you know, this incredibly detailed diary that he shared with me. But also, you know, that Aerosmith chapter, you've got Jimmy Crespo comes in to replace Joe Perry and Aerosmith. Mm -hmm. And Rick Dufay comes in to replace Brad Whitford. Fascinating. I mean, Rick Dufay is an insane man uh -huh. with great <laughs> stories and, like, just obnoxious and tackling people. But he also was, like, <laughs> saving. He was with Tyler, and many people would make the argument that he was, like, his babysitter almost. Mm. I mean, he was, like, a babysitter who did a lot of drugs, too. But he really took care of him. And Jimmy Crespo is fascinating to me because if you go to YouTube and watch his playing, he's by far the best technical guitarist Aerosmith ever had. He mm -hmm. can play things that Joe can't play. I mean, I want to. Joe cannot play. I don't think I've ever heard Joe play "Cry Me a River." Mm -hmm. I, you know, some of the solos online are blistering, but Jimmy Crespo is not almost built for Aerosmith. Like he's very fragile. He's very insecure, and uh, it was kind of heartbreaking to tell that story. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to understand how hard he worked to try to make something special. And ultimately, uh, from his time with the band, which was as much time as, you know, actually more time than Mick Taylor was in the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. they make one record, you know, Rock in a Hard Place, which Jimmy Crespo's name is all over the songwriting credits. But that record is not considered a success in the Aerosmith oeuvre. But, you know? well, and looking back, there, there might be a tendency of uh, the fans to say, well, there was this period where they brought in these hacks and it wasn't really Aerosmith because Joe Perry was gone. But that's not that's not the case. These guys weren't slouches that they brought in. They all had their 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 different. Uh, they, they contributed in some way. It was a different you know? band, but it was not not Aerosmith. I mean. Jack Douglas says it wasn't Aerosmith, but I mean, I don't know. I think it was still Aerosmith, it's just a different band. I mean, I just saw Mop the Hoople, right? Mm -hmm. And they didn't have Mick Ralphs on guitar. They, it was like the 1974 version. And in fact, it was really only the guitarist and the keyboardist and the singer. Mm -hmm. But it was Mop the Hoople. I mean, it's perfectly, it's not like when Joey Moland, Moland plays as Badfinger and he's the bassist and the two right. lead singers are dead. It's not right. like that, you know. I mean, it still it still Whereas, was Aerosmith, just a different version of it, you know. Like the the different versions of the Ink Spots that were touring for right <laughs> seven versions of Platters. You know, I mean, is Aerosmith? You know, is Van Halen Van Halen with with you know Sammy Hagar? Is mm -hmm. it Van Halen without Michael? Ant you know, it this gets into like super rock geek spots, and you know, it's up to the fans to decide. But I mean, the the problem with Aerosmith in 1982 is that their record wasn't that good. Right. That was, you know, that was the problem. Or at least there wasn't the the single. There wasn't, you know. Lightning like, Strikes was an okay song, but no, it's it's just it, what you know. I I think that record's okay, mm -hmm. but you know, it's not. No one's going to listen to that over Rocks or Toys in the Attic. Mm -hmm. You know, or Get Your Wings. And then Run DMC's fortunes after this sort of trail off a bit they they're still recording until what 2007 or something was that the last album or is, what was the last official last i think album? it was earlier than that i think like 2001 wh whatever crown royale was yeah right? i think that's their last one i mean the problem is they got into a lawsuit with a record company and it kept them on the sidelines for basically two years until tougher than leather came out in 88 mm -hmm. and you know in the world of rap two years is an eternity especially know? those two years in yeah. particular i mean it's not that different from thinking about how me rock music went you know if you if you make a record in 65 and then you don't then you you don't put one out until 67 mm -hmm. the well, world has changed well that's that you could make the analogy to the kinks not being able to tour in america for, or the for, stones yeah, yeah the stones not being able to tour. yeah absolutely i mean at least the Kinks and the Stones, I mean, at least they could make music mm -hmm. and put it out and show that progression. When Tougher Than Leather comes out, which I think is a great record. I like Tougher Than Leather, but it can't compete with what's been hitting, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, by now, Public Enemy is is in the mix, and there are a lot of people in the mix, you know? And and you did get a, a shout-out from Chuck D posting that the book is essential reading. That had to feel... My God! <laughs> that had to feel great. I can't, but you know, I keep trying to get, you know, like I get the book, like there are all these people that I think would be helpful to like, ultimately when you're, when you write a book, you want people to read it. So how do you get people to pay attention? So it's like, I'll send stuff to like quest love. I, it's just like a hole. I can't ever find out if it ever gets there or anything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I send the book to, you know, I send it all over the place, but 
I got one to Chuck D and then I wrote him and I was like, Hey man, I just sent you a book. And you know, what do you think? He's like, I got it on my own. And then nothing, <laughs> there was just nothing. And I thought, <laughs> oh, geez. and I did like little things to try to suck him into the vortex. Like I, uh-huh. I tweeted something with his page in the book and tagged him and I thought, Oh, he'll retweet that. Nothing. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, wow, Chuck must hate this. And then I woke up the other day and Chuck has a big picture of him with my book in his library. I was like, mm-hmm. Whoa, that's, I mean, you almost would write a book for that. Right. You know, I mean, that's, that's, uh, I've, I've covered the arts for, uh, for a while, for years as well. And it's, it's hard to explain that sort of feeling. Uh, and it's not sort of a, an idol worship sort of thing, but I remember the, when I, my first big interview was George Carlin and having his voice come out of my phone was sort of, the, this this weird thing where you had to keep your professional cool but there's like 14 year old you is going that's george carlin's voice coming out of my phone i always say that thing i mean i always just re- first of all if it's genuine i never avoid saying it but i always wait till the end yeah so i don't say you know i've heard paul mccartney talk about this and i've interviewed paul mccartney and it's like you know when i'm talking about to Paul McCartney about the intricacies of making flowers in the dirt, Mm -hmm. there's already an understanding that I'm like a super fan, Uh right? So I don't need to be like, Paul, I just want to let you know you've been my hero for years. And I just don't need to do that. You know, like there's already an understanding. And most of these people, like you want to establish like a kind of intelligent, even level of conversation. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm talking to Chuck D, which I did for the book, I'll wait till the end and be like, hey, Chuck, I just want to let you know I so appreciate everything you've done. You know, I grew up listening to what you did. You know, whatever. Mm-hmm. The thing. He, By the way, during that interview, I know he'd already yelled at me because he tried <laughs> to get me. He asked me to identify the Furious Five. And I couldn't. I, I'm trying to think of exactly what the exchange was. But it was like he said he asked me to identify him and I couldn't name them all. Mm-hmm. And he was like, that's shameful. And I was like, look. I don't know the Doobie Brothers, you know, like uh-huh. I can't name all those guys. I know there's that Michael McDonald guy, you know, but I, I, I got his point. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, uh, you know, but I don't know, like, you know, it's like, I know Cool Moe D. I, I, I don't know. Do I know all the, do I know the Treacherous Three? Do I, you know, so I, I, I'm not sure I have like that kind of a, a detailed, skilled knowledge of everybody mm. in the world. But it was just a funny thing because we had that little back and forth. And I think he appreciated the Doobie Brothers thing. And then you give him the compliment, which is genuine. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. talking to, you know, when Grandmaster Flash is on the phone with me and telling me about raising a, a record to the light to see how shallow the groove is. God, it's like, what a lucky thing that I get to hear that, in, you know, right. personally. It's ridiculous. Well, that was another such a weird thing that, that the depth of an, of an album has an influence you know it's those butterfly wings flapping in chaos theory has an influence over the music because you know if the if this record won't scratch well even if i want to use the content of it 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 doesn't happen i mean grandmaster flash using walk this way which you know i found and you can find on youtube an example of the walk this way beat being used in 1978 Mm -hmm. on a on a tape of his that's why Run and Daryl are in the studio in 1986 messing around with that mm-hmm. beat when Rick Rubin walks in and goes, hey, you know what that is? And they're like, yeah, number four in Toys in the Attic. He goes, no, right. no, no, that's Aerosmith. Right. Who are they? I mean, it wouldn't have happened if you hadn't had DJs like Grandmaster Flash putting that into heavy rotation as a beat. Right. And Walk This Way wouldn't have happened if Joe Perry hadn't been listening to the, to the meters. And the band hadn't seen Young Frankenstein, right? So, what? Uh, how delicate is all of this, uh, and how deliberate is it? Is it as well? You could say, you know, you you talk about people who make hits, and there are people who who can who can make you a, a top forty hit, and but really, it, it's the public could all could just say. Yeah, I don't. I don't like that. You could put all the effort into it and do all the put all the tricks you want into something to make it popular or try to make it have an impact. And if people just sort of look at it and shrug, you're done. That's it. Well, that's how you get the Velvet Underground, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
purposely uh, or, or how or you Ross on Roland Kirk or something, you know, it's or, like or Liquid Liquid, who's you the, there's another story in here about right. their song Caravan, the the bass line basically being white line. Absolutely, yeah, Liquid Liquid. It's like you know, I mean, a lot of that's a Blend Bronca. It's like you know, you have these things that are made that change music, and they might change it in a way that's different than we might think of, you know. Mm-hmm. They don't change it in the way that they create all this product and money and cash for the people and change their lives. And that way it just changes it in that it might influence one person who mm-hmm. needs to hear that. You know, I mean, Tila Rock, It's Yours, is not a very popular song. Mm-hmm. But that's the song that Rick Rubin produced first and that Russell Simmons heard and mm-hmm. said, damn, what's this guy doing? That that gets them, you know, that I don't know if that is all that gets them in a room together, but it's something. Mm-hmm. So uh, suddenly, it's yours becomes incredibly important. Right. In the way that maybe Slim Whitman is important to the Beatles because he was left handed. And Paul had never seen a left handed guitarist until he saw left, Slim Whitman and, and realized, oh, I can turn this thing around this way. I don't have to play it right handed. Yeah, you know, I didn't know was, that. Slim is, Whitman? Yeah. I never liked him because they had that, imp, that like TV commercial with. Stuff. <laughs> right, and the, I just thought he was kind of a joke. Him is and Slim Car Willie. Is he good? Yeah, he's he's got his own sort of thing going. I mean, if you're an Andy Kaufman fan, you're probably a Slim Whitman fan as well. I mean, why? Because he's a joke? No, well, because Andy Kaufman covered Slim Whitman on David Letterman. Uh, was it My Rose? What was the song? Or Rosemary? And it, he's got that sort of beautiful lilting uh, voice. Uh, but is he a real like? Like if I like uh, say like a George Jones or something, or if I like Billy Joe Shaver, if I like maybe not Billy Joe Shaver, Merle or no, no he but he's got this sort of throwback thing. There's kind of a purity to him. He's not he's not a heavy rotation guy, but he's a guy to throw in every once in a while and say he he had you know he had his own he had his own thing. He was uh, a a legitimate player and if, if, right, I'll, maybe i'll give him a shot you know ernest tub yeah you know, that's my kind of thing yeah yeah that was old uh, country and i, I want to talk a, a, a bit about just sort of covering the arts in in general you have a long history you know this isn't just you didn't write just this book you write for the washington post you you've written for the boston globe how do you wind up covering the arts? I know you sort of started out as a reporter. Yeah, I just did. I mean, I was just talking to somebody about this the other day because he had come up with a scheme to save newspapers, and I liked that. Because, like, you know, when I got out of college in the early 90s, there were two ways to go. One is you could go to New York and, like, get coffee for people at GQ mm-hmm. and then, like, do front of the book items, and eventually somebody would allow you in. I didn't really have the courage to do that. Like, I, I don't know. I just didn't think that would work. So I just worked as a regular reporter. I it was at the Sudbury Town Crier first, 3,000 circulation weekly paper. Mm-hmm. We speak on a school committee meetings, finance committee. I moved on to Waltham. I worked as a t- city reporter covering mm-hmm. the schools. I learned about overrides. I learned about how to... It, so it was about not, 1996, there was a job open in North Carolina at the Raleigh News and Observer, which was a very good paper then. Now it's not quite as... Like most papers, it's just much smaller and struggles, but as a local arts reporter Mm -hmm. and uh, I got that job and I love music and film and stuff, but I, I I would never call my, I never want to be a critic because I just don't think I'm smart enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went down there and started working as an arts reporter. And what I found is that if you're covering politics or you're covering like schools, there are just people everywhere. It's like packs of people, like especially with politics, Mm -hmm. just pack reporting. With the arts, it was cool because no one was actually doing – either you had critics who were writing super smart stuff or you were mm-hmm. having people who were like, oh, it's arts. Like, why don't we get the intern to write about it? Like, right. they weren't taking it seriously. So if you could work that beat as a reporter with the knowledge of how you ask for public documents and read budgets and, and did real investigations and with the skills of a magazine writer, you might mm-hmm. have something really special. And so that's kind of how I developed that beat. I felt like I could do things that people hadn't done. So I got, I did a lot of freelance work while I was in North Carolina, as well as writing for the newspaper. And then I got a job at the Boston Globe as their arts reporter in 2001. Mm-hmm. I did that for 13 years. I covered museum, symphony, 
did oddball stories also mm -hmm. and uh built that beat and uh a lot of page one stuff like really focused in on that trend mm -hmm. stories and then i got you know jeff bezos bought the washington post and expanded it dramatically and hired me to be this national arts reporter and it's you know i started that in 2014 and i'm just so lucky to be doing that i mean basically like i did a story on roseanne Barr. Uh, a few weeks ago and um you you went to israel yeah no one i mean no one the stories that i do are just ideas that i have and i have i'm never told to like not invest in them time wise <laughs> or money wise i mean i don't go and like stay at the ritz carlton thing but like the roseanne Barr story you know it'd been a year since her famous rise and fall with her disastrous tweet and there'd been a million stories on Roseanne Barr, but nobody had really written a story on Roseanne Barr, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to. And I was emailing with her back and forth, and it's complicated. And But finally, she was going to Israel, and she agreed to let me hang out with her. It was unclear for how long. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just told my editors that. And one of the other editors, uh, Emily Kodak, who's really good, actually was the one who flagged the trip to Israel and mentioned it to me. And I said, oh, God, I've been trying to do this Roseanne story forever. And she's like, well. So I worked with her on it. And um, I went to Israel for eight days. I mean, I was with Roseanne Barr basically for eight days mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. That's pretty weird. Yeah. You know, in her hotel room, our photographer there. And the story we got is a story unlike anybody else could get. It's not because I'm gifted. It's because I was there and I recorded what I was doing and I asked mm -hmm. every question I wanted to. I got people like John Goodman and Sarah Gilbert and, you know, I got... Emails that kids. people weren't supposed to see, mm -hmm. you know, showing what was going on back back of house at ABC as they tried to figure out how to deal with this incredibly popular show centered around an incredibly unpredictable figure. Mm -hmm. You know, the same thing last year when I profiled Chevy Chase, um, you know, and also when I did an investigative story in R. Kelly, it's like I'm working at the Washington Post. What a great gift. I mean, mm -hmm. how can I not work hard and try to do the job right? Well, I mean, you you do bring the reporting skills to it because because I was I was going to phrase the question as you get to do these wonderful deep stories, but it's not you just get to do them. You have the skills to do them, and your approach is different than than some other people's approach might be, which is why you 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 do them in the first place, which is why you're where you are. Well, I mean, I have a very you know like Roseanne and Chevy Chase are two examples, but. You know, it's like I was listening to Mark Maron's podcast a couple years ago, and he had Henry Winkler on, and Henry Winkler just mentioned that he had this plant, the spider plant that he had taken, uh, that his parents had smuggled out of Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. and he still had it. I mean, maybe it was a 25-second anecdote inside one of those Maron podcasts. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? And uh, I wrote to his person immediately. I said, I want to do a story on Mr. Winkler's plant. And I had to meet him for lunch first so he would trust me, mm -hmm. which I did. And he's a very nice guy. And then he had me over and um, we looked at the plant and talked about it and how it connected to him having dyslexia and how, you know, he had brought it to the set of transparent. He'd cut a sprig off to give them mm -hmm. and how it had gone into the theme of one of their episodes. You know, his parents escaped from Nazi Germany. It was just so interesting to me. And ultimately, the story is like, why does the Fonz have a spider plant smuggled out of Nazi Germany? Um, and it's about Henry Winkler, but it's not a conventional story mm -hmm. on him. And the only way you can do that is if you're curious and try to think fresh, fre freshly about about everything. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the thing that keeps what we do afloat, and I know because I get numbers for all my stories, the reason we do well is because we're providing big stories that people can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's been the ultimate failure of newspapers in the last 10 years. Their response to the problems with advertising and budgets and has been to shrink and say, oh, you know what? Mm -hmm. Like we can do what we can do better than anybody else is we can cover stuff locally. Well, I talked to my kid, you know, she's really smart and 16, but she does not really care about like the local zoning board meeting mm -hmm. or like even like school committee issues. I'm not saying they're, they're not important, but she will be like, Hey, did you read about that guy who lives in San Francisco in a box for $200? And I'm uh -huh. like, Oh my God, I, where'd you read that? And she's like Buzzfeed. I'm like, no, no, no. That was in our paper. They just repurposed, it. you know, like, so mm -hmm. it's about finding the big stories and uh, you know, it's hard sometimes because you really want to, you want to raise the bar, basically. You want every story to be as big as it can be. 
But once you find it and sink your teeth into it, you're you're you you're on to something. Well, plus artists have their own platform to reach fans directly that they didn't have even ten years ago. So that that I think is going to have and probably has had a huge impact on arts coverage. I know that sometimes I'm not getting interviews I would have gotten ten years ago because somebody's got their their Twitter feed, their their Instagram, and they don't need the 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 coverage like but i turn down stuff all the time i mean i they're like oh neil young will talk to you and rolling stone um but and i'll go okay and they'll go but one condition is you can't ask him about his ex-wife who recently died Mm -hmm. and uh you can't ask him about this or something and i'm like i'm gonna pass on that you know because like i read rolling stone's interview with stevie nicks Mm -hmm. and there's no question about lindsey buckingham either quitting or getting booted out of fleetwood mac it's crystal clear to me when I read that that the agreement was if you're going to talk to Stevie Nicks, you're not allowed to ask about that. Well, mm-hmm. forget it. We're just not going to do it. We're, we're, we'll do something else. We've got enough stuff to do, mm-hmm. you know? So it works both ways. I know what you mean. Like, it changes the nature of the celebrity profile slash Q&A. But also, if they, do, if, if they understand what they're doing, you know, it, it can launch what they're doing much more if they're honest and give us a chance to do mm-hmm. it right. I remember talking to Cat Williams years ago, and he had just gotten in trouble with with the law, and uh, he, that was the big story everybody was asking. But in another story, he had mentioned how much he loved Don Knotts, and that blew my mind. And that's all I wanted to know to the point where I turned in a story with no mention of what had happened like two weeks ago about this, and the, and they're like, "Well, what what about this?" And I had to call him back and got a, a pretty a fairly lame quote he didn't want to come back to the phone but uh, i i got a a, a a fairly lame response to whatever that was but i felt like th- to me that had been covered well i don't know if this is true or not but norm mcdonald told me once he said that he had proposed interviewing oj for his one of his tv shows <laughs> right. maybe it was like a sports show and, oh, he, and man. he got pretty far and he said one of the conditions that he placed on it was he told O.J.'s attorney the only thing he wouldn't ask about is the murder. Mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty bizarre and entertaining and uh-huh. so counter. Because, I mean, what we do in our business, it's always like you do the story and they're like, well, we have to move this up, you know, because this is the news thing, which I uh-huh. totally get. But um, just the idea of going counter to that sometimes. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, and I think what you do is kind of the arts journalist version of slow food like you're not i have i don't think i've seen much in your reporting at least the longer profiles that that had much to do with the trend unless it was trying to sort of debunk a trend like the chevy chase story well the chevy perfect. chase one what's interesting is what gets repurposed is off, often the opposite of how you know so like i i can predict ahead of time what's going to happen but like the you know the chevy chase one the thing that got repurposed over and over and over again was Chevy Chase saying something negative about Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. Now, I couldn't leave that out of my story, but I didn't want that to be my story. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, when it starts getting picked up by other people and rewritten, that's what they're going to focus on. Right. So you did a, a podcast called Edge of Fame. Yes. Is that coming back or are you doing something? I don't think that's different? coming back. It was it was. It was kind of an experiment, and I think it went really well, but it was also a lot of um, effort on everybody's part. I mean, it was a lot of effort on WBUR, and it was also a lot of effort on The Post because it was co-produced, mm-hmm. and um, and it was a lot of effort on me. I mean, I was carrying the stupid tape recorder around <laughs> everywhere I went. I loved how it worked. Mm-hmm. I would have liked to have done some things better. I think I could have done better sound-wise, but what I loved about it was that I was not like Mark Maron. Now, I'm not saying this in a negative way, but most podcasts are like the Mark Maron model. You have, mm-hmm. well, it's actually our model. Yeah. You <laughs> sit with some dude and you guys are talking about something. Cool. Um, what I liked about it is that it was a documentary style profile of a figure. Mm-hmm. So you, I was just running my tape all the time. So you never knew what was going to happen. So, you know, I think that when you're talking to David Letterman, it's one thing, but when you're walking through the Mark Twain house, which is odd anyway, Mm -hmm. and you just have your recorder going with him, or you're standing, like you're walking through like 
you're near the Hudson River and you're just walking around, mm -hmm. or you can bring in outside stuff. Um, I think there's something different that's going on. I mean, I put for that for my Jimmy Kimmel episode of that. I just put my recorder on his desk for eight hours. Uh -huh. And when we got the tape back, I was like, you know, you'd have like an over an hour, you'd have like 53 minutes of silence. And then a couple like blips in the tape, you're like, oh, there's something mm -hmm. going on there. But you're able to do as much, you get as close as you can to capturing something naturally. And I think that's really important. I mean, walking with Ava DuVernay through the Disney set and her stumbling upon, um, Who's the actor she ran into? Blair Underwood. Mm -hmm. Unrehearsed is really great. Or like going for three days with Billy Joe Shaver in his van through Texas, <laughs> right. watching him get into like near fights with people. <laughs> I just don't think people get that. Mm -hmm. You know, Norm, my Norm episode was one of my favorites in that he had like a gambling relapse partly way through, but wasn't like, turn that thing off, you know? Mm -hmm. Or I brought the thing into the Tonight Show backstage and no one knew i had a recorder and i just captured a jimmy fallon coming up to him without anyone you mm -hmm. know it's just do you have you must have to go back and and clear this stuff with people afterwards though right that one was a funny one because that one the weird one about that one the norm mcdonald episode i've dealt with networks for years i know how much you have to go through to clear stuff mm -hmm. i mean i walked into saturday night live with michael che and colin jost when I was doing a story on them and Michael Che had forgotten his badge mm -hmm. and he had to go to security and get like a guest pass. Mm -hmm. When I went to, you know, Norm was going on, on Jimmy Fallon. This was actually the famous night that Jimmy Fallon must up Trump's hair. Mm -hmm. Norm oh. was the second guest. So Norm was going on Jimmy Fallon to promote his book. And he said, um, I called him and I said, Norm, could I get a little bit of audio with you? And he's like, Hey, why, why don't you just come? So I hopped on the train. I went to New York. I met him for lunch. And then we walked over to Saturday Night Live, and um, I had this recorder around my neck. We got there, and like the security guy was like, Norm, how you doing? And uh, he's like, oh, good, good. This is my friend from the Washington Post, Jeff Edgers. He's like, oh, come on up. We got upstairs and into the green room without anyone saying, who are you and why are you here? No one asked mm -hmm. for my license. No one gave me a badge. Bear in mind, the future president of the United States is on this show as well. The entire building is in lockdown with like secret service everywhere and i have this thing around my chest and who knows mm -hmm. who i am um so i just thought that it was surprising to me how little and and what ended up happening is i was cat i was walking around with norm he's going up to steve higgins who's you know fallon sidekick and also really underrated and brilliant comedy mm -hmm. producer and he's talking to him i'm recording it norm has lost his jokes and he's i'm capturing all that and then jimmy fallon comes in talks to norm and i'm just i'm not pretending to anybody else i'm holding two microphones in my hands like uh -huh. like you know sausages or something and jimmy fallon talks to norm and then he leaves and as soon as he leaves a bunch of nbc people came in and they go uh is there a reporter in here and i'm like yeah that i am and then they're like we'll need your tape and i'm like well first of all we don't have tape we have a mm -hmm. you know chip and then you know i was cool about it i tried i just explained to them look i was with norm covering him for this thing that I'm doing. I'm not like some weirdo. It's not like I'm Project Veritas or something. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm like, I'm at the Washington Post and, you know, from WBUR. So there was no reason. They know who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, look, I'll let you know what's going to... I didn't get approval per se. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't say, listen to this ahead of time and say if it's okay. But I just called them and let them know what it was and gave them a little bit of courtesy. because. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like Jimmy Fallon came in and said something super embarrassing or, you know. I feel like most people are fairly reasonable about this kind of stuff, but there are some people who go into it with that, you know, a certain agenda. You can't talk about this or that, but most people generally aren't as guarded. Yeah, as I mean, that. you know, it's not if you make a documentary, sometimes you've got to get someone, you know, the personal. Like I interviewed Paul McCartney for my Kinks documentary mm -hmm. and it was ridiculous that you know he said yes and it cost me a lot of money to film his segment it was mm -hmm. like 30 grand out of a budget of like 140 thousand mm -hmm. i had to get light people makeup people and then paul mccartney or his manager call him whoever you will wouldn't let me use the footage i don't know why mm -hmm. they just said we thought this was a conventional kinks document i don't know what that means because i had written exactly what it was mm -hmm. so i lost that and really frustrating but i don't think that that's not how i work as a reporter we can't let people say oh we're not going to let you know we're not going to use this mm -hmm. so right 
So what's coming up next? What are you working on? Well, I next? can't tell you what I'm working on, but I'm, I'm working on a couple large stories that I hope will be high impact. I am working on another podcast for The Post, mm -hmm. which is going to be a post-produced podcast without any other partner. Uh, and those will both, I mean, that stuff will come later in the year. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about it, though. I mean, like it's, I'm doing more of a documentary styled um historical podcast and i'm trying to do one that's three or four episodes mm -hmm. of one story so it's just about gathering you know just the reporting process is the same basically except that i have a lot more transcribing to do right <laughs> which is the the best and worst part of the job yeah the I'll, I'll go for the worst part uh -huh. well i mean it's it's where this uh, for me a lot of times it's where the story takes shape every once in a while there's something I didn't pay attention to, I didn't quite hear, it didn't register, it didn't stick with me in the interview, and then I'm transcribing, going, oh, wait, and I to go back to, to what did they just say, and it sort of shapes the story. Something Having the recorder made. going is great. Yeah. I mean, you don't miss anything. Yeah, and and for me, part of part of this podcast was people, got, people now have, have heard Stephen Wright laugh. Right! Which, which is... A wonderful thing that 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 in you know a, a decade or more more when I first started talking to him, people wouldn't get that. Only I would get that. To get to hear that laugh, this wonderful, generous laugh. Well, and, you're. Th I mean, the one regret I have about Edge of Fame not going on is, you know, what you're talking about is you now have this incredible uh, library mm -hmm. of figures that's just going to keep growing yeah you know that's why it's sometimes it's better to have a podcast that isn't like business first slash or business a major part of it mm -hmm. to just do it and then just see what you have yeah. you know it's like that judd apatow the book that came out with which is the interviews with the comedians it's mm -hmm. like he just had that he'd just been doing that because he was passionate about it and suddenly the guy has this incredible library of comedy interviews boy mm -hmm. publish them right right well the the to me the interview is the the muffin top of the whole experience it's the thing that i enjoy the most about the the whole process yeah yeah i i, I agree with that totally so you never know what's going to come up you never know what someone will say or how they'll react to something or how bad it'll be i mean i have this interview with martin short about chevy chase and it's one of the worst interviews i've ever heard it's mm -hmm. full of all the, the minefields that you shouldn't go through. But I have it recorded. I kind of like it. I don't know if I'll be able to do something with it someday. Do put out a, a negative land sort of uh, a single with that as the the uh, yeah. <laughs> as the, the the vocals in the background. So you can't even tell. Just, just put a whole bunch of compression and echo on it. So people right. don't even know it's Martin Short. And then put a trip hop beat behind it and... It's like the hipster bebop junkies, right? Yeah. Well, thanks for for doing this. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. hey, uh, anytime, and I'm I'm really glad you did. Thank thanks for uh, thanks for being interested. An arrow to the head isn't always a trick. Thanks again to Jeff Edgers for a great conversation. You can find him on Facebook and Twitter, read his work in the Washington Post and the Boston Globe, and find Walk This Way on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Powell's, and at all the hippest booksellers. If you like this or any other episode of the Department of Tangents podcast, please consider subscribing or rating and reviewing on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Department of Tangents is a one-man operation, and it's a tremendous help in getting the word out. And you can also find out more at thedepartmentoftangents.com, the blog of this podcast. Now this week's featured track, Something Good About Love by Nat Friedberg. Some of you might know Nat better as Lord Bendover from the Upper Crust, those hard-hitting purveyors of rock and roll who performed for years in their powdered wigs and finery. They were also guests on episode 32 of the podcast. Friedberg has taken off the golden coat, but he still wields his Gibson SG, and he has put out an incredibly tasty solo album called Better Late Than Never. I don't want to give away too much before next week's episode when you can hear about the crust and this Friedberg's first solo album in nearly 40 years of recording music. But your homework is to listen to it in full with all of its wonderful surprises so you can fully enjoy the episode. Here's a little nibble in advance. This is Something Good About Love by Nat Friedberg. Something 